In my last video, I alluded to the possibility that we are not being told the whole truth about the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. And considering it took over a year and a half before mainstream media admitted that Hunter Biden's laptop was indeed Hunter Biden's laptop. Yeah, why on earth wouldn't we question what we are being told about the war in Ukraine right now? In this video, I am going to explain some of the economic and political factors that might have contributed to the conflict. I will follow up with a third video explaining the cultural and ethnic history of Ukraine, which has also contributed to the conflict. Here is a little tidbit I forgot to mention in part one, but would like you to keep in mind. In 1994, Ukraine, Russia, and five other former Soviet states joined NATO's Partnership of Peace. This was a trust-building arrangement, which in 2014, NATO decided to kick Russia and Ukraine out of. Which kind of brings up the question, is Putin really that concerned about um, Ukraine joining NATO? Now to delve into the meat of this video by explaining how important oil and gas is to Russia. 40% of Russia's federal budget comes from oil and gas, and 60% of Russia's exports are also oil and gas. Furthermore, Russia's natural resources are responsible for 60% of its GDP. For comparison, U.S.'s domestic oil and gas industry contributes about 8% to our GDP. Therefore, I think it's understandable that if Russia's energy industry is threatened, Russia isn't going to be too happy. While Russia's economy was and is predominantly dependent on resources, Soviet Ukraine's economy was primarily based on manufacturing. And the reason why Soviet Ukraine was able to build up its industries was because of the cheap gas it got from the Soviet Union. When the USSR fell, a whole new oil and gas market opened its doors for Russian oil and gas, and their prices for oil started rising. Did you notice that it only said oil prices increased? This is because oil is priced according to the global market, whereas natural gas prices and the pipeline fees associated with transporting that natural gas is negotiated and then set in a contract. So while the cost to Ukraine for all the oil it imported from Russia increased, the cost of gas imported to Ukraine stayed about the same. So until the contracts between Russia and Ukraine expired, Russia was stuck selling low-priced gas to Ukraine, while at the same time being dependent on Ukraine's system of pipelines to move oil and gas from Russia to Europe, where Russia could sell its natural gas at a higher price. This total dependency that Russia had upon Ukraine's pipelines may be one reason why Russia didn't put too much pressure on Ukraine to pay off its billions of dollars worth of debt. But what was that debt for? Mostly it was for gas that Ukraine had bought from Russia. You see, in 1992, Russia committed to take on all of the USSR's debt, which was about $100 billion that it was owed to the International Monetary Fund, the US, and the EU meaning that in 1992, Ukraine started out with only the $2.6 billion it owed Russia. However, since then, Ukraine has run up about $57 billion worth of debt to the Western creditors. If you remember, in Part 1, Russia offered to forgive Ukraine's debt in exchange for control of the Black Sea Fleet. Instead of accepting Russia's offer, Ukraine counter-offered to sell part ownership of the Ukrainian's pipeline system. But before the deal could be signed, Ukraine, dis Ukraine changed its mind. Not only that, but Ukraine's parliament um, passed laws prohibiting the privatization of Ukrainians' pipeline. It might be suggested that Ukraine's decision to keep ownership of its oil and gas assets was an attempt to stop or at least reduce corruption, and also to show the world it was moving away from communism. But instead, it really didn't do that Instead, it just made it a lot easier for people in, in the government to make a lot of money. For example, Mykola Zolachevsky founded a small company called Burisma. And in 2004, when Zolachevsky chaired the State Committee for Natural Resources, he used his position of power to block a Polish-Ukraine venture to the benefit of his own company. Zolachevsky also used his position to obtain exploration permits in Ukraine. 
If Burisma sounds familiar, it is the Ukraine company. Hunter Biden was paid $50,000 a month to serve on the board of directors for 60 months. So Hunter was paid $3 million over five years by Burisma. So, yeah, while refusing to privatize the oil and gas assets might have slowed corruption in the short term, mostly it led to under-the-table deals and often violence. But more on this a bit later on. So where was I? Oh, yeah. The issue of the debt remained unsettled. However, Russia was forced to cut off gas exports to Ukraine several times between 1991 and 1995 because Ukraine wouldn't pay for the gas that it had bought. Ukraine would then, of course, start making payments again, but by 1994, Ukraine's debt had grown to four to four and a half billion dollars. And about this same point in time, um, Ukraine's pipeline started diverting gas. By the way, diverting gas means stealing. So, as well as stealing gas, um, corruption in Ukraine led to trading concessions. In other words, if you give me a kickback, I'll let your company buy more gas than your competitors. Yep, doing business in Ukraine was a lot of mafia-style fun. And that was sarcasm. We are now up to 1998. Ukraine had reformed and reformed again how it wanted to handle its pipelines and its gas purchases. But like the reform before, the system was plagued with corruption. Finally, the question of the debt was settled in 2001, but only after Russia discovers the theft of the gas and cuts off all oil exports and electricity to Ukraine in the winter. Actually, when Russia seems to get fed up with Ukraine, it's usually in the dead of winter, which wasn't very nice, but it was effective. Ukraine admitted to stealing about 280 to 250 billion cubic feet of Russian gas. So how much was that worth? In Colorado, the price for residential natural gas in December of 2021 was $10.32 per thousand cubic feet. So by today's standard, Ukraine stole more than two and a half billion dollars worth of gas. And by saying Ukraine, I don't mean the money got into the government accounts. It went into the pockets of the corrupt Ukraine politicians and businesses. From here on, it's going to get really a lot more complex as if it hasn't already been complex. But I'm going to try to keep this as short as possible. The pro-president of Ukraine wanted to settle the debt it owed Russia. The president therefore appointed a pro-Western prime minister named Viktor Yushchenko to negotiate the deal to pay off the debt. Once the deal was made, the people of Ukraine, who were already pretty mad at Russia for repeatedly cutting off the supply of gas in the wintertime, got angry at the government for what they saw as being favorable to the Russians. And they pushed for Yushchenko to be replaced. Granted, it's not as simple as that. It also seems that a bunch of Ukrainian elites didn't like being caught stealing Russian gas, so they kind of pushed to have Yushchenko removed also. But as is common when mobs react without first knowing the facts, three years later in 2004, in what became called the Orange Revolution, Yushchenko beat the pro-Russian presidential candidate and became the president. You might remember Yushchenko as the guy whose face was disfigured after surviving an attempted assassination by poison. But don't feel too sorry for Yushchenko. It would be discovered in 2005 that Yushchenko's business ally and partner would have stolen Russian gas again. So now we are at 2005 and Russia learns that more gas has been stolen when its European clients report the gas they were supposed to get from Russia is short. By the way, um, Europe got about 25% of its natural gas from Russia about this time. So Russia and Ukraine enter into negotiations to determine how Ukraine is going to pay off the stolen gas. And Ukraine offers to pay for the gas with weapon supplies. But at the same time, um, Ukraine also wants to start ne renegotiating the lease between Russia and Ukraine in regard to the Black Sea Fleet in Crimea. When Russia doesn't accept the weapons offer and ignores the suggestion to premature increase the rent, Ukraine informs Russia they will not renew the lease past 2017 and that the Russian fleet based in Ukraine will have to vacate by 2017. Maybe I'm wrong, but somehow I think stealing and then threatening to evict a tenant 12 years before the lease is up 
doesn't speak particularly well for Ukraine. As you might be able to imagine, Russia is getting a bit miffed. So in December of 2005, Russia says that if an agreement can't be reached by the 1st of January of 2006, Russia is going to cut off the gas supply again. Therefore, Ukraine offers a joint venture to the pipeline in exchange for gradual price increase and also threatens that if Russia doesn't want to do this, they're going to go to international arbitration. But Russia doesn't fall for this delaying tactic like it had years before, and it says, okay, let's go to arbitration. Of course, Ukraine claimed they didn't steal the gas and claim it must be a technical issue. However, the pipeline belongs to Ukraine, so it's, even if it is a technical issue, it's still Ukraine's problem to fix. So when the negotiation fails, Russia reduces the pressure on the pipeline and only puts enough gas into the pipeline for its Western European customers. Granted, since the pipeline belongs to Ukraine, Ukraine took the gas for itself and the European countries saw a drop in their gas supply. About now, the World Trade Organization got involved and made the suggestion that all post-Soviet states start paying full market price. You see, up until then, Ukraine had been paying about 30% less for its gas than the rest of the world. So as you can well imagine, Ukraine restored the supply and agreed to a five-year contract right away. So it was all sunshine and roses until um, Ukraine would slow pay and not pay its bill to Russia for several months and Russia would of course stop the supply and then they'd negotiate again and it would all be sunshine and roses again until Ukraine would once again start slow paying and not pay its bill for several months and Russia would cut off the gas again and then this just kept going on and on. But to be fair to Ukraine, this was in 2009, and this was when there was the worldwide recession, and Ukraine just simply didn't need as much gas as it had agreed to buy from Russia. But as the amount of gas Ukraine was supposed to buy was also tied into reducing its debt to Russia, Russia insisted Ukraine fulfill its obligation. So again, Europe got involved, and the whole mess went to arbitration. Ukraine ends up losing and must return 430 billion cubic feet of gas. I could continue with more examples of um, Ukraine reneging on contracts and stealing gas, because they do, but um, they also get a little bit sneakier at it, and as I don't need this video to be too terribly long, I'm going to just tell you they keep doing it, and I'm going to move on to some other points. One of the points I want to make is that during all these years where Ukraine and Russia are having conflicts over debt and over payments and the gas gets turned off and on. Um, Ukraine keeps telling the world that the conflict was because Russia didn't want Ukraine to become part of the EU. So yeah, according to Ukraine, Russia wasn't actually angry that billions and billions of dollars worth of gas was being stolen or that Ukraine just never paid for the gas they bought. It's all because Ukraine wants to become part of the EU, which you can believe or not believe. I'll leave it up to you. Okay, the second point I want to make. Because Russia had been so dependent on the Ukrainian pipeline to move its gas from Russia over to Western Europe, it decided to hell with them and it would start building its own pipeline. So it started a project to build a pipeline from Southern Russia under the Black Sea to connect with Bulgaria. It would be called the Cell Stream. Italy, Bulgaria, Serbia, Greece, Turkey, Slovenia, Croatia, and Hungary also joined the project. The groundbreaking ceremony took place on December 7, 2012, and was going well until 2014. So what happened in 2014? Actually, an awful lot of stuff happened in 2014, but to, in order to understand 2014, we need to back up a little bit further. So, do you remember me telling you about a guy who was poisoned and disfigured? That guy's name was Viktor Yushchenko. He beat a guy named Viktor Yankovich in the presidential election of 2005, but then he lost to Yankovich in the presidential election of 2010. I wish I could just call them by their first names because their last names are so hard to pronounce, but they're both Viktor. If you will recall, in 2005, Yushchenko gave notice to Russia that the Crimean 
lease for the Black Sea Fleet would not be renewed. This was kind of a big threat because the um, Crimea is the only warm water port on the west side of Russia that Russia has access to year round. Its other port is up north and it's frozen in most of the year. But this wasn't the only threat by Yushchenko. Um, I'm going to explain the ethnic and cultural factors leading to the current conflict in my next video. So for now, please just take my suggestion that Eastern Ukraine has more in common with Russia than it has with Central and Eastern Ukraine. So with that in mind, when Yushchenko suggested the gas that had been stolen by his business partner was actually a technical issue and that they needed to shut in and test the pipeline in eastern Ukraine, he meant it as a threat against the ethnic Russians living in eastern Russia, I mean eastern Ukraine. Oddly, when the UN, because the UN did get involved, UN went to monitor the test, Ukraine didn't show up and they said, oh no, the problem was somewhere else. Now we're up to 2010 and the new president is Yukonovich. Now, it has been suggested, and I don't really see any reason to deny it, that Russia pushed to get Yankanovich elected in 2010. And the reason is, is that Yankanovich in 2010 um, went ahead and extended the Black Sea Fleet's lease that was supposed to expire in 2017. He extended it to 2042. The extension of the lease was very controversial in Ukraine, especially among the more pro-Western factions in Ukraine. However, at the same time this was all happening, the International Monetary Fund had been putting a lot of pressure on Ukraine to get a handle on its deficits and its debts. So perhaps Yakanovich's idea was to actually be in a more favorable position with Russia since Russia held quite a bit of the debt for Ukraine. We are quickly approaching 2014 and tensions between um, pro-Western and pro-Russian factions in Ukraine are mounting. The pro-Western factions want to join the EU, although truthfully the EU kept telling Ukraine it had to clean up its act first, which still hasn't happened and it's seven years later. But back in, back in about 2013 and 14 when um, Yankovich decided against um, closer ties to the EU in favor of Russia, um, a bunch of riots broke out. 121 people were killed and Yukonovich was forced from the office. When he was removed, um, Eastern and Southern Ukraine, including um, Crimea, started to protest themselves because they didn't want to be part of the EU, they preferred Russia. But I'm not going to go into um, the Ukraine Civil War in this video, I will in the third. Instead, I'm going to um, end this video by proposing that Ukraine's problem isn't just that it is a very, 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 very corrupt country, but that it isn't actually a true oligarch. So what exactly is an oligarchy? Well, an oligarchy is a group of owners who have the largest private ownership in the country. They possess significant political power to promote their own interests. And these owners control multiple business interests, which allow for even more control. So while it can be suggested that Russia is an oligarchy, Ukraine has too many competing business sectors for a true oligarchy. So think about it. Russia has as its main and pro most predominant source of um, income being oil and gas. Therefore, it's a little bit easier to have an oligarchy because it's all centered around oil and gas. Whereas in Ukraine, it's far more you know, separate, a lot more different industries, a lot more different power places and power struggles, which is probably why Russia is actually far more stable of an economy than Ukraine. Ukraine is just a bunch of warring mobs Perhaps it is the instability that is Ukraine that has led the East and the South and Crimea to want to leave Ukraine and become part of Russia again. My intent with this video was to explain the more recent or modern history that shows the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. Um, in my next video, I hope to kind of explain a little bit more. But thanks for listening.